Okay, everybody, let's say it together. 2023 is one of the best years in gaming, but you really didn't need to hear that from me. If you've got a controller, a mouse and keyboard, a mobile device, whatever you play on, there was constantly something new for gamers in 2023 from beginning to end. And now as we say goodbye to 2023 and prepare for 2024 to grace us with even more exciting video games, it's time we look back on some of the amazing titles we played this past year. But today, we're not just talking about any games. We all know the Zeldas, the Spider-Mans, the Armored Wake Fantasy 16 Diablo Hogwarts Survivors, whatever. Needless to say, we've all heard about the AAA experiences. This video right here is for the indies. Hey there, I'm CG Danny B, and these are my top 10 indie games of 2023. Now, in case you missed it, I love indie games. And today, I just wanna gush about 10 or 20 of the indie games that brought me so much joy this year. Now, just remember, this is my personal top 10. I'm not saying grand scale any of these games are better than another. Trust me, they're all great. These are just the games that I found the most enjoyable in 2023. So be sure to let me know what your favorite games are from this year in the comments below. But before we get started, please do me a huge favor and like the video. Not only does it help the channel, but it also helps show more people a bunch of dope indie titles and perhaps they'll end up going to play them. Also, real quick, this is usually where I do my honorable mentions and I talk about 10 games that didn't quite make the final cut. However, I think that kind of ruins the surprise and tells you right off the bat 10 games that won't be on my list. So, I'm a seal trick from Watch Mojo here, and we're moving the honorable mentions to the very end, right before number one. How's that sound? So, who's ready for my number 10? Now, most of the time, I prefer my single player narrative experiences. Honestly, like you know, seven out of 10 times. Hint, hint, wink, wink. But here I've got a bunch of multiplayer games that I fell in love with this year. And the first one being Doomsday Paradise. You guys know me and the boys love our multiplayer dating sims, i.e. the Monster Prom franchise. But there's a new kid on the block that's taking everything we love from the Monster Prom series and adding even more fun to it. In Doomsday Paradise, you play as one of five heroes who set out to save the world before Doomsday hits, while also trying to find true love along the way. As you start your adventure, you'll choose who you wish to bung by the end of the game. But that's secondary for now. First, you gotta level yourself up. You'll go from shop to shop, interacting with the colorful cast of characters around town, gaining favor with them and making them want to bung you right back. If you make the right dialogue choices, you can get new companions who will buff your stats, powerful weapons that'll do a lot of damage and magical spells to inflict status effects. And from time to time, waves of evil creatures will attack the city. And now you've got to use those skills that you learned to save the day. Each day in game, there's a new narrative beat where you and your monster buddies can either buff yourselves or potentially screw each other over. But either way, you could just build your own cool lore like we did. Like Stuart the Space Mouse being filled with sin and spreading his bad intentions all across the land. By the way, I know it's called the Curse Beam. Uh, are you guys cool to start calling it the Sin Beam? I'm cool with that. Sin Beam? Being able to sit in a call with my friends, voice act as a bunch of goofy characters, and entertain my Twitch chat with games like this is always such a special time. And though the Monster Prom games are a typical go-to, I love having Doomsday Paradise on the wheel of horning monster games that we can play. Number nine is the game that easily gave me the most laughs, screams, cackles, and snorts this year, Party Animals. Now, if you somehow haven't heard about this fantastic game, Party Animals is a goofy physics-based multiplayer party game where you and your friends are just here to have a hilarious time beating the snot out of each other and trying to win some goofy mini games. You'll pick from a huge collection of animals like dogs, cats, lizards, cows, bears, ducks, otters, oris, crocodiles, and so many more. And then it's time to drop in for an insane clash of nature, where you'll be playing some wacky soccer, throwing each other into toxic gas clouds, or even tossing yourself across two speeding trains to win a race. The variety in the different types of levels keeps the chaos and the wild animal antics coming at you nonstop. Getting together with a bunch of streamer friends while we throw paws, talk mad shit, and almost pass out from a lack of oxygen to the brain from laughing too much goes to show how much fun this game really is. Whoa, what's going here. on over there? Get nothing. Damn, <laughs> no, don't worry face. about it. Don't worry Damn. about it. <laughs> Party Animals constantly leaves you with this unsteady balance of win or lose. You can feel the grasp of victory dangling just before your fingers to then be yanked away by a stray bomb or you're trapped in a position where winning looks impossible for random banana peel to send your victim flying and you take the dub. It's hard to say that Party Animals is fully original when Gang Beast is sitting right there, but I've always felt like that game had so much room for improvement and just simply wasn't getting it. But Recreate took everything that players love from Gang Beast, made it fluffier, added way more modes, online matchmaking, and so much charm that it's hard to not have a great time. All of that alongside a free battle pass type reward system, earning in-game currency to buy new skins, an item shop that admittedly could use some more content, and new unique maps that always seem to have a reason to bring you back into party animals. I think we all knew this one was coming up. That's right, this is Lethal Company. You and your buddies are space exploring garbage men who happen to be way in over your heads, as horrific monsters and dangerous weather makes your job far more difficult than it should be. What I love about Lethal Company is how it's meant to be a horror game. But because so many gamers are desensitized to death and violence, we all laugh at how our friends get mutilated right in front of us by whatever demon decides to come after us that day. Plus, with the retro PS2 style models, the game feels strangely nostalgic yet modern at the same time. Lethal Company ultimately has two different styles of gameplay. 
Sometimes you're locked in, with the man in the chair telling you where all the scrap, monsters, and traps are, while the team inside is killing it by avoiding danger and updating the cockpit on the hazards ahead, earning major units for your crew. And then there's the days where you all just throw caution to the wind and decide to full send it into the facility with no true plan and eventually all get eaten alive, step on a landmine, or fall down a huge hole because you jumped into a guardrail. But somehow, it's still insanely fun nonetheless. Lethal Company is still in early access, so the game is far from its final state, but the fact that this game is already so popular on a global scale, while still lacking features in that true polish, just goes to show how dope this game is going to be in the long run. Thankfully, we have the modding community that is currently covering all the things that the fanbase wants. Now honestly, I've never been big on modding my games. It just always seemed like it was more hassle than it was worth, and 90% of the time, it just didn't even work. But with the better inventory, all the suits you could ask for, and even more monsters that we really shouldn't be excited about, I'm talking about you, Mimic. Modded Lethal Company has been awesome. <laughs> Why does it so well? <laughs> now we currently don't know what the future of Lethal Company is just yet. Will there be more story, a true endgame, new monsters, character customizations, quality of life improvements? Even just thinking about what's to come down the road has me excited to experience Lethal Company 1.0 with the boys. <laughs> So 2023 seemed to be one of the biggest years ever when we had to discuss the definition of an indie game. There's arguments that indie and independent mean different things when technically they don't, but also they kinda do, yeah, blah, 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 blah. It's a mess. And there was one game from this year that kept hopping on the list, off the list, back and forth, and finally I decided I'm putting it on. So I know a little introduction is required, but this is Dave the Diver. Meet Dave, a wholesome guy who's a deep sea fisherman by day and a hip sushi bar owner slash waiter by night. In this 2D adventure game, you'll want to make customers happy by giving them the best place to hang out and eat raw fish in the middle of the night. Why these kids want this, I have no idea, but there's a market for it, so get your bag. The deeper you explore into the mysteries of the ocean floor, the more exotic fish you'll capture to sell in your bar and increase the status of your restaurant, bringing in knockoff versions of real-life celebrities to even further your restaurant street cred. However, there are some people who aren't exactly okay with your restaurant's methods, so a not-so-beloved animal cruelty organization is out to stop you from running a legitimate business. Thankfully, you've got some pretty dope people on your side, helping you cultivate your farm, catch extra fish, and upgrade and purchase new equipment to make your fish catching more doable. Now, I've never been one to hide my absolute polarizing thoughts on the ocean. Though I love the crystal clear blue waters of our planet, I know there is so much shit down there that we've never seen before, and I'm not gonna be the one to discover Cthulhu and his army of shadow sharks. I just won't do it. But thankfully, Dave the Diver gives me the ability to escape from reality and enjoy the ocean floor without actually having to get wet or drown because of a giant octopus. And it gave us the hot hit of the summer, Bacon Sandwich. I'm diving in the afternoons, serving sushi at the noon. But after that, I go home and I sit and I make myself a delicious bacon sammy. No, I don't put no lettuce. No, I don't put no tomato. No, I don't put no mayo. Just a slice of bread and some bacon. Magic. One of the most played out power systems in media. Just a bunch of wizards swinging around their wands and making sparkly stuff happen. And sometimes I just wish there was another device I could use to activate my magic abilities. This is Wizard with a Gun. And the first thing I hear anytime I bring this game up is, Wow, that looks like Don't Starve. And it sort of does, but I don't enjoy Don't Starve. But you know what I do enjoy? Wizard with a mother gun. In Wizard with a Gun, the world around you is collapsing fast. Like in five minutes fast. Luckily, you have access to a secret base between time that allows you to study, enchant, and craft your own bullets flowing with magical powers. Your ammo can cause fire damage, thunder damage, ice, poison, charm, oil, explosive, so much damage. And once you're ready to set out, you've got five minutes on the clock to explore a collapsing world. Find the mechanisms that you need to improve your time machine to go back even further to take down bosses, learn more magical bullet spells, and save the world. While searching for the important stuff that you need, you'll see these cute yet hostile pink creatures known as Chaos. Defeating them can slow down the corruption of the world, giving you more time to explore, and sometimes even rare crafting materials to unlock new crafting stations and more strong ammo. As you can see, this game's all about building more ammo. Wizard with a Gun is one of those games that I could just turn off my brain and explore. If I could only tell you how much anime I watch while blasting through hordes of enemies, setting forests on fire, and breaking into bases to steal special loot. The gameplay loop is just so enjoyable to me. Sure, often some runs aren't as successful as others. I've run into enemies that I couldn't overpower or got distracted by a bunch of cute little book golems and realized I wasted my entire day and gotta go back home. But that's the fun of a roguelike like this. Each instance of the world could leave you with a different experience, a new lesson, or even just a fond memory of spilling oil on a giant frog and lighting it and all of its babies on fire. Plus, it's always fun to run in and enjoy an adventure with your buddy. 
Now, most of my playtime was single player, but the one night that I did stream Wizard with a Gun with my buddy Connor, one of the developers from Galvanic Games showed up and told us how devilishly handsome we were, and that they let Ryan the Music Man know that we love the soundtrack. Oh, this trailer said though. Oh, <clears throat> sorry, I uh, forgot I was recording a video. <clears throat> Where were we? Although I am now realizing that I didn't include Wizard with a Gun when I was talking about my multiplayer experiences earlier, so I guess it was more of a six and a half times out of ten, uh, just for those keeping track at home. But yeah, Wizard with a Gun, it's uh, it's fun. I know we've all had that dream where you're running around as a small cicada who doesn't speak, but carries around giant orbs and drops them into other giant orbs to solve puzzles. No, that's just me? Oh man, that's awkward. Well, if you've ever wanted to play a weird yet dope puzzle experience, Cocoon is the way to go. From the same creator that brought us Limbo and Inside, Cocoon shares a similar vibe with a whole new dimension. Possibly even a few new dimensions. With no dialogue throughout the game, you explore an atmospheric journey with strange environmental structures and intricate puzzles that really get your brain up and running. A large majority of Cocoon's puzzles are focused around these giant orbs, which you use to dive into micro-universes, find the solutions for the larger world waiting above you, and then progress further towards the end to find even more micro-universes. Each one of these different worlds that you dive into features a different tone, style, and color palette. One world may be a desert biome filled with orange and browns to give you that dusty feeling, while another is coated in grays and purples inside of a factory-like structure, feeling much colder and mechanical than the rest. You might also want to get a notepad ready because you're going to need to remember where you place each one of these universes. Sometimes you'll place one orb inside of another, and then you'll have to go back and take that first orb and put it inside of a third one, but now the first one is inside of both of them, and it's, it's a mess. You really don't want to be misplacing universes. Now that I think about it, I really don't think it's safe for a little bug man to be messing around with something like this, but it's a video game, so have at it, I guess. There's also no real death in this game. Sure, you may lose a boss fight or two, but you don't die, you just get tossed back out of the universe you were in. Cocoon is a masterclass example of building tension in a world with no simple direction, but leaves the player plenty of hints around the environment to figure out what exactly they need to do next. You just gotta be ready to keep your eyes out for them. Oh, okay, hold on. I need to get something for this next one. Just wait right there. All right, hold up. Yep, I found them. Yeah, here you go. You're, you're gonna need these. My number four game is in Stars in Time, a black and white RPG about the final quest in our hero's adventure going terribly wrong and finding our leader trapped in a never ending time loop. You play as Sifrin, an adorably quirky trap master who may not be qualified for the role they've been given. However, lucky for you, each time you're experiencing something in the game, Sifrin will remember that. So you look like you're actually good at your job. However, on the sad side of things, each run seems to end with you or your friends meeting a tragic end. And now you wake up in the same empty field all over again, ready to start fresh, but never forgetting the trauma that you faced the days before. In Stars in Time is an insanely dialogue heavy game with so many conversations between you and your party. And there's gonna be times where you feel like the conversations don't feel important, but trust me, they are. Some of these conversations would give you vital information for progressing through the Big Bad's tower, while others would tug at your heartstrings and make you fall even more in love with the characters in your party. Again, why I gave you those tissues. As you battle through the tower of the final boss, you'll fight smaller creatures called Sadness using rock, paper, scissors. Literally. You examine your enemies and take note of what sign they're holding up. Then use the appropriate party member to do the most damage and collect that lovely XP. In Stars in Time has a heavy, and I mean heavy, focus on mental health. Depression, loneliness, identity crises, sexual identity. God, there's so much. So consider that your content warning before the content warning. But I can't explain enough how impactful this game was for me emotionally. I felt so many connections to the characters in In Stars in Time that even though I wanted to see the finale of our character's story, I never wanted my tie with them to end. It's always tough to talk about indie RPGs because a lot of them take inspiration from Earthbound and or Undertale, so the comparison becomes a bit played out. But do me a favor quick, think about how much you, uh, your friend, that one YouTuber loves Undertale. You got it? Okay, now, I would easily play In Stars in Time over Undertale any day. Right? That's crazy, dude! Now you can't fathom how someone could say something like that. Well. I just did. So, go play a Stars in Time and see why I say that. Do you have any... Kings. Ah, go fish. Darn it. Do you have... Any aces? How? I swear, you you have to be cheating. <laughs> Give me that. Nice. Got any eights? <laughs> no. Go fish. Dang. All right. Mm, you're go. <laughs> well, do you have any warriors tried in battle? Ones that fell to defeat? However, that warrior spirit still burns within them, and they wish to bring this December weather to an eternal end. Yeah, here you go. Oh, 
Yes, give me, give me. <laughs> Homie, this game stopped me from playing so many other games this year. Watt for Us comes in as my number three game of the year, but easily is my favorite roguelike of 2023. The world has been taken over by an endless winter, and your village is the last surviving settlement around. So it's up to you and your people to face the dangerous weather and bring the end to this wintry hell. As you journey across the winter terrain, you'll find a mess of unexpected characters along the way. Some are shopkeeps who will sell you charms and cards to upgrade your deck, while some people you'll run into will join your forces and aim to help you end winter for good. A lot like any other deck building roguelike, your goal is to build a cohesive deck of warriors and items to give you the best opportunity of eliminating the enemy armies. You have snow, which slows down your enemies, teeth, which causes you to do return damage anytime you're hit, ink that dispels your special abilities. But my personal favorite has to be overburn. Basically, you put burn counters on your rivals, and once their health reaches below that number, Boom! They pop and do damage to everything around them. And sometimes that overburn carries to other enemies. So it's like a fireworks show on the other side of the battlefield. God damn it, just writing this script makes me want to go play more Wild Frost. So a little behind the scenes look here. While confirming my top 10 games of the year, I actually completed my first run of Wild Frost. And boy, oh boy, did it feel good. Sadly, the giant victory screen didn't exactly put me at ease. But gosh darn it. I want to beat this game so bad. I just, I just need the right cards. But I could suffer through the pain of defeat over and over again if it means I get to stare at more of this adorable card art. Like, seriously. Chucklefish, Deadpan, Gazeter, whoever I need to contact. If you ever make a physical edition of these cards, I need a set. I don't want them. Need them. <sighs> okay. The placement of this next game might shock you a bit, but my number two game of the year is Sea of Stars. Okay, you can pick your job off the floor right now and let me explain myself. So, if you're new here, Sea of Stars has been my front of mind, most anticipated game of 2023 for, well, probably since it was announced. As the prequel to one of my favorite games of all time, The Messenger, Sea of Stars has you play as two Solstice Warriors, Zael the Sun Warrior and Valir the Moon Warrior, who are destined to defeat the Fleshmancer and his diabolical monsters of the Eclipse. Sea of Stars takes heavy inspiration from games like Chrono Trigger, which admittedly, I've never played. Honestly, JRPGs aren't my cup of tea. Well, unless they're indie JRPGs, then yeah, it would appear that they are. At no point while playing through this game did I have a lull in my enjoyment. The combat constantly had me try new combinations of attacks with the lock mechanic that the enemy forces have. If you hit each monster with the correct style moves, you can stagger them and cancel their turn, thus giving you more time to beat them up. Again, with this game being so heavily tied to the messenger, which already sports a retro and modern pixel art style, Sea of Stars is almost like the next step in the Sabotage Studios art style. But it also gives me the warm and fuzzies when I see a location with the same name from the messenger. And as soon as I step foot into that beautiful red leaf forest and that music kicks in, oh bro, it's 2018 all over again and I'm loving it. I mentioned a while back on stream that I finished the game and I was going for the platinum trophy. However, because my ass wants to remain spoiler free, I unfortunately stumbled into a missable trophy where I completed the post game without picking up a collectible. Now I could no longer go back and get it. So what did I do? That's right. I started my new game plus run, played through the entire game all over again, got the collectible, and finally popped the platinum trophy. Now, will I go back and do it again in the PS4? Maybe. Just not right now, because I do not have time for that. But my entire second playthrough allowed me to experience the game with the knowledge that I already had, making me notice new things that I'd missed the first time, and not once did I get bored playing through it from start to finish yet again. From the art, to the characters, to the world building, I love Sea of Stars. And with the T's expansion coming sometime in 2024, I can't wait to see what's next for Sabotage and the world of the Messenger. Before we get to our number one game, I want to be sure to highlight 10 more indie games from this year that just missed the cut, but I loved them nonetheless. Power Rangers meets Mega Man in Gravity Circuit, a fast-paced, challenging action platformer that had me gritting my teeth from time to time, but victory was so, so satisfying in the end. Upgrade your armor, learn new abilities, and smash your way through bosses to save the world from robot mayhem. The world of League of Legends is no longer trapped behind a toxic MOBA experience. Riot Forge allowed us to have the Mage Seeker, a top-down adventure about Silas the Unshackled. Build your army to rise up against the Mage Seekers and shut down the tyranny for good. Maybe. This is the swaggiest little onion knight you're ever gonna meet. Rhythm Sprout is a rhythm game about a lazy little onion, dancing to lo-fi beats and battling bosses to K-pop and EDM. Though the levels get faster and faster, the drive to slice over some nasty candy fiends is always a fun time. Take a childhood storybook and mix up the way things work in Storyteller. Read the title of the chapter and find the best way to add characters, actions, and settings into this comic book style novel, and finally put a period on the end of this sentence. Though I wish the game was a little bit longer, there's so much fun to be had in the chapters of this storybook. The silliest roguelike I've ever played, Goobies adds a blobby, wiggly, and goofy energy to the Vampire Survivors formula. Play as characters like Dizzy Wizzy, Hoozy Woozy, Bingus Bongus, and more to defeat the waves of endless jelly-like enemies. One of the most impressive first-person puzzle games to ever exist, Viewfinder puts you behind the camera and allows you to manipulate the world in front of you. 
take a snapshot, place it anywhere, and see just how much it can really change your perspective on your own world. The habitat is filled with people who just don't have it in them to smile anymore. In Smile For Me, you'll complete weird tasks for the people around you and hopefully bring a smile back to their sad little faces. A game so nice, you'll want that platinum twice. Undertale meets Monsters, Inc. in the charming and heartwarming story of Meg's monster. Play as Roy, a stubborn monster who suddenly has to babysit a little girl in a world where humans aren't necessarily welcome. If you already finished that box of tissues that gave you for in Stars of Time, you might want to go get another one. Born of Bread is a whimsical take on the Paper Mario series that puts you in the shoes of Loaf the Flower Golem. Make new friends and save the kingdom from a dastardly group of demons who want to bring back an army of the undead. Another weird case of, is it an indie game? But Baldur's Gate 3 is more than deserving of the title of Game of the Year. And though it's partly an honorable mention because my PC can't handle to play it and record footage at the same time, Baldur's Gate is easily one of my favorite games of 2023. But there's definitely some other indie games that need more time in the spotlight. So I've been doing these top 10 videos since 2017, and 2023 may be the toughest year ever that I've had to narrow down a list for this video. Like, realistically, I would just post a picture of my Steam library and say, go play all of these games, but that's not quite as entertaining. But now the game that broke out and became my indie game of the year is Dredge. So before I talk about why I love Dredge so much, let me tell you how I came down to this conclusion. If you saw me picking nominees for indie game of the year at the Game Awards, I was struggling to choose between Sea of Stars and Dredge. I spent so much time debating and ultimately picking Sea of Stars for indie game of the year and Dredge for best debut indie. Fast forward to the night of the award show. We're all watching Jeff breeze through the off-screen winners when indie game of the year pops up. I was sweating not knowing which one of my babies was gonna come out on top. Until so the moment Jeff goes. And the game award goes to Dredge. Sea of Stars. I mean, like, ah, Stars, like I'm not even mad. I was so happy to hear Sea of Stars get the recognition that it deserves. But in that moment, my only thought was, man, that should have been Dredge. And that's when I knew that Dredge was my game of the year. So if you haven't heard of Dredge, I'm sorry, you're about to get an earful. You play as a fisherman who wrecks his fishing vessel. But no worries, the lovely mayor of this small island city helps you out and gets you repaired. For a small fee, that is. So, you run a couple errands for him, find some fish, deliver some packages, and you're off scot-free, right? <laughs> no. After this, you basically find yourself in a chain of favors, finding stranded people on various islands, searching for missing jewelry or family heirlooms beneath the ocean surface, or exploring deep, deserted locations that no right-minded person would ever go to. But unlucky for you, you're definitely not in your right mind. Because if you're out in the water late enough into the evening, you're going to start to see some things. Are they real? Who knows? But they sure as hell feel real. There's this ever so interesting push and pull of Dredge's gameplay. One minute you're out in the water just fishing for some small guppies to sell for upgrades. Until you find yourself lost in your activities and then hear all sorts of weird noises, see strange ships in the distance, and then maybe notice some creatures in the water that can't possibly be real. Just an old fisherman's tale, right? Well, I'm not so sure. As you sail through the surrounding areas of the Greater Morrow at night, nothing is ever as it seems. If I could only tell you how many times I ran into a freaking rock that I know for a fact wasn't there before. But right now I gotta race home before the sea monsters get me, so I can pay for the repairs and go out and do it during the day, when it's safe. This year more than any other game, Dredge was my late night obsession. I log on to the game at 5pm to look at the clock just a few minutes later and all of a sudden it's 2 in the morning. And having a game eat up so much time without it feeling like it has is saying something about my enjoyment. I've never really been one for the Lovecraftian aesthetic, but putting it into a game with so much atmosphere, so much simplicity, and strangely enough, so much charm, left me with the lingering desire to pad out my gameplay as much as possible. Spending nights looking up wiki articles to learn where I can find a specific type of fish in hopes of reeling in that anomaly version, so I could finish my entire Pokédex of fish and then pop that platinum trophy. Dredge was just a fun time. It's as simple as that. More often than not, games that drop at the beginning of the year struggle with being remembered, especially in a year where there's always something new to play. But Dredge has always stayed in the back of my mind and at the top of my list since it dropped back at the end of March. And now after talking about it so much, I'm finally going to make time to go play the Pale Reach DLC that's been sitting installed for over a month now. Unless you're seeing it here, then that means that I didn't record enough footage earlier in the year when I did my first review, and I need to capture more. So, I'm sure I enjoyed the DLC a lot. And there you have it, my top 10 indie games of 2023. This top 10 video is one of my annual projects. I do this video every year, and this year I decided instead of struggling to rush it out for New Year's Day when everybody's already with their families anyway, I'll just give myself a bit more time, make it something special, and I think it came together pretty well. So if you did enjoy the video, please do me a huge favor and like the video. It helps the channel so much more than I can explain. 
And if you want to stick around, be sure to hit that subscribe button because I got plenty more indie game videos coming. I've got my most anticipated for 2024 video. I've got 10 indie games that I missed in 2023. Uh, my monthly breakdowns of upcoming indie games, which I probably need to get to because there's no way in hell that I got my January one out already. If I did, I'm a monster. But yeah, subscribe for more indie videos. Thank you guys again so much for watching this video. And of course, I have to thank the indie developers who worked so hard, not just this year, but surely for years and years before to make these games for us to enjoy. I hope you all have a happy new year, a great year in gaming, and I'll be sure to see you right back here next year. Peace.